since breakfast. Uh, so the first question is, uh, so how was the commute? How did you get here this morning? No, we didn't ask that question. <laughs> so a bicycle, there you go. How many gallons? I walked. So we'll hear today from, from Molly Burke, who's the state representative for Brattleboro District 2, and uh, was on the transportation committee of the uh, state uh, assembly. And uh, all about transportation. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here and talk to you about this. I have sort of uh, my agenda. I'm just going to try to run through things fairly quickly because I think people probably have a lot of questions, and I think we can have a really good discussion. I'm just going to, uh, by way of an introduction, I was elected to the legislature in, in 2008 to represent District 2 in Brattleboro. And one of my impulses that, that uh, why I wanted to run was that uh, I've been very concerned about climate change for a long time, and particularly as related to automobile emissions, sprawl, and livable communities. They're all really related. And uh, over the 40 plus years that I've lived in the Brattleboro area, I've noticed you know, quite a lot of increase in traffic, and, uh, you know, I think that's true in, in many of the Vermont communities. Also, I'm a visual artist, and I organized a couple of few exhibitions of poster art at Amy's Bakery on the subject of um, automobile emissions and how can, you know, using art as a way to encourage people to change behavior. And the, um, the title of the exhibitions were The End of the Romance, Cutting Dependence on Our Automobiles. So, you know, I think that, you know, we all agree that the United States, we have had a, a romance with the automobile. It's been a you know, symbol of freedom, and, and yet it's, uh, it's also been sort of polluting our environment and changing our climate. So when I was elected to the legislature, I asked for, and fortunately received appointment on the Transportation Committee. So uh, I'm just going to talk about a, a, a few um, specific instances of legislation related to the things I just talked about. Then I'm gonna talk, oh, and, and about um, issues from recent sessions of the General Assembly, uh, general transportation issues, current and future related to safety, funding, and emissions as they impact local, state, and federal governments. That's what I said I was gonna talk about. So I, I think once I got to the legislature, I realized that things really uh, happen slowly. And, and yet things, and I'll, I'll come back to this point too, yet things really, for things to move, things require, one of the uh, ingredients is local advocacy. So that's where, you know, the general public comes in. And I've seen that work in a really wonderful way. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the bicycle community really got behind in 2010, and I was the lead sponsor of the Safe Passing Law, which meant that uh, defined, it didn't define a, a uh, foot limit, but that people needed to exercise due care, increase uh, clearance when passing a vulnerable user. A vulnerable user being a bicyclist, a pedestrian, a person in a wheelchair, somebody riding a horse, or whatever. So it's really, it was about, and, and actually this law was uh, useful when a bicyclist a few years ago was harassed on Putney Road. Oh, that also has an anti-harassment provision in it. Uh, was harassed on Putney Road, and the the people who did it were received a fine and wrote a letter of apology. So, you know, laws do serve for educational purposes. I was also, I worked very closely with AARP on the Complete Streets legislation. And that meant that uh, that was passed in 2011, that any new transportation project had to take into account the needs of all users of transportation systems. And uh, that was particularly came from a survey that AARP had done about people who wanted to, elderly people wanted to age in place, maybe didn't want to drive so much, wanted to have better access to public transit, to um, better sidewalks and things like that. So that means that they need to consider. It means that not, not every case is impossible. If it's too expensive, there are always exceptions to the law. But at least it's there and people can follow it and AARP has been monitoring process of that. By the way, they are a really fabulous organization and uh, have done a lot of good work in the state house. Uh, I was also um, uh, involved in the anti-idling legislation that passed last year, 
which means that uh, you can only idle a vehicle, you can't idle a vehicle for more than five minutes. And particularly, uh, this helped, there were uh, reports of diesel trucks idling their engines for hours at a time near daycare centers. And I think everybody here knows that the damage, particularly diesel fuel to lungs and, and putting out particulate matter into the environment. So that was, and, and that came about through, and I think this sort of illustrates the legislative process. My, the chair of my committee, who's a Republican, actually went to bat for that provision. It was inserted into a, a motor vehicle, a miscellaneous motor vehicle law. So it's really interesting that a lot of times you just have to have the right alignment of people. And, and uh, it's really sort of illustrates, I think, that we do have a spirit of cooperation in our, and uh, functionality <coughs> in the Vermont legislature. Uh, and right now, for next year, I'm working with AARP on a bill to um, make it possible for towns to set their own, their speed limits as low as 20 in village centers without a traffic and engineering study. So the state has a lot of authority over speed limits. And sometimes, I remember years ago, we wanted to get the speed limit lowered to 15 in our neighborhood. They said, well, you can't do it. It's sort of 25 by default. So that's something, we introduced it last year. AARP is doing a lot of outreach over the summer. They do a lot of, of advocacy at the grassroots level. And we will be trying to um, get that through this year. So those are specifics. And the general, but the general picture is that um, funding and uh, federal funding in particular. The Highway Trust Fund is in danger of being insolvent by July. I think, I can't, I haven't kept up, maybe somebody else has, with exactly what's happening with the federal reauthorization bill, but uh, the, the gas tax in the United States has not been raised since 1993. It's 18.4 cents a gallon. So the money, the Federal Highway Trust Fund has just been losing money and it's been supplemented by money from the general fund. And, and that's because it seems to be politically unpopular to raise the gas tax. But the gas tax is really a user fee. And it's really sort of boggles my mind that that has been so controversial. And now this is like an example of not planning, not forward thinking, oh yeah, well we're not gonna raise the gas tax because we might not get reelected. But then people clamor, why, are, why can't you fix my road? And why, you know, what about this bridge that's falling down? And we know we have crumbling infrastructure. So we have a huge funding problem. Uh, and, and even then, the, the most recent federal reauthorization bill called MAP 21, Moving Ahead of Progress in the 21st Century, it's an acronym, it does not provide sufficient revenue for Vermont's long-term transportation needs. Approximately 50% of the funding that we use with transportation is federal, and 50% is, is state, state revenues. And uh, just to maintain the system that we have, we can't let the bridges fall down. We have to, uh, there's a responsibility to keep things safe, keep roads safe, uh, bridges, aside from all the other things that we want, like public transit and rail and bicycles and better sidewalks. And the state revenues, we've had declining state revenues because the good thing is people are driving more fuel efficient cars, but the gas tax revenues have not been you know, keeping up because, because of that. So people might be driving more, but they're driving more fuel efficient cars. Basic gas tax last session, you may remember, and there are a lot of discussions about how else do we fund our transportation system. We do a VMT, vehicle miles tax, vehicle miles traveled, as one way to do it. There have been some pilot studies in the country. How do we account for uh, the uh, amazing uh, uh, surge in the interest of electric vehicles, which is which is happening? How do how do we um, like incentivize that at the same time as, as make them pay as make that you know form of, of transportation pay for itself? So there are a lot of really challenging issues. The estimated annual cost to maintain, operate, and administer from us transportation system to, from 2014 to 2018 is $700 million. That's annual. So that's like there's a $240 million gap between revenues 
and needs. And that's with, again, no new capacity. Ironically, Tropical Storm Irene created a big infusion and, and the um, stimulus money before it. So Western Avenue paving, the state was able to come up with some money to do sort of a Band-Aid fix on Western Avenue. Uh, Band-Aid is $200,000, more or less. And I really want to give public credit to the Agency of Transportation for listening to the issues that were happening in Vermont and for trying to come up with a solution because they really didn't have the money and they went to bat and tried to find it. So uh, I, I think that one of the things that I've found in being a legislator is that we're not dealing with faceless bureaucracies there. We're dealing with people and people, particularly in VTrans, whom I have the pleasure of getting to know a lot are really thoughtful people who are trying to, uh, they're not just, you know, uh, appointments that were made because of political contributions. They, Governor Shumlin has appointed really, really good people to these agencies. Um, there is a study plan, which some of you may have been at the meeting where they presented, there's a, a, a study funded by, by Green Trans to look at this corridor from uh, Edward Heights back towards the bridge that goes over the Whetstone where there's no sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, we're on one side, there's no sidewalk. And to look at that and see how we can improve that. But that's going to be some, some time out. So I think the issue is, you know, how do we deal with safety in general, pedestrian and vehicle <coughs> safety? I have been involved, some of you may know about the Safe Streets Project in the wake of the four fatalities and numerous bicycle accidents that have happened over the past few years. Uh, we got local motion, which is Burlington organization, to come down to Brattleboro and work with uh, people in the town, working with the town manager, the police chief, public works, um, some uh, bicycle pedestrian advocates to figure out what are some sort of short-term solutions, low-cost solutions, to make our streets safer. And, and in the wake of that, the um, uh, health department has just gotten a $7,700 grant continue working with local motion to look at, uh, they're going to look at, at a review, sort of, and that the initiatives that have happened to date regarding safety, and then they're going to identify strategies that are proven useful for safety, particularly in small towns, and then they're going to develop a prioritization matrix, and then think about how to apply it and how to, you know, get the funding. So that's a very positive and I would just say that, um, you know, the future, challenges, there are lots of challenges. Funding is a challenge. Safety is a challenge. Changing the culture is a challenge. How do we change the culture so that, uh, you know, you look at, if any of you have been any city in Europe, they're just so far ahead of us in terms of making an accessible communities where people can get around without an automobile. You know, just for example, the, the Amtrak train that comes through Vermont is wholly funded by state money. We are paying to have that train, and that's because the state really believes in rail. And then there's um, the whole climate change issue, which is huge. 47% of Vermont's greenhouse gases come from the transportation sector. There's a big, like, it, the interest, there have the, been like a 300% increase in, in people buying electric vehicles. And then I guess uh, the final thing I want to talk about is the role of the public. If you have public involvement, public participation in a positive way, uh, coordinated advocacy, and you have somebody on the inside of that, of the legislature, people on the outside, people on the inside, key uh, people in the administration, you can actually, you know, get things done eventually. And one thing I did, did want to mention is, I don't know if everybody knows, but in addition to subsidizing the Amtrak, the state is subsidizing tickets on the Amtrak within Vermont. So you can get anywhere in Vermont on the train for $12. Now, it's a little bit of a challenge because you have to go on the website and find out what the code is on Amtrak. They don't know anything about it. <laughs> and, and you have to say, no, I want the special code, B, and I forget because the numbers change every year, so I don't want to give you a number until I know what it is. And then you can get that $12 fare. I think you have to make a reservation at least 24 hours in advance, something like that. But you can do that. So uh, unfortunately, the way the trains go, if you're going north from here, you have to stay every night. 
come back up. Um, but um, for people coming south, if you have any friends and relatives who want to come to visit, they can get on the train, arrive here as long as the train is on time at whatever, 1230-ish, whenever it arrives these days, and then go back at 5.05. And in fact, Jason Von Dreisch, who's the one of the local motion people who's been coming down from Burlington, has been doing just that, coming down on the train, spending the day in meetings, Walk from the municipal center, walking down the street, getting on the train, going home. I mean, this is what it used to be. And I know people who, you know, there used to be a train from Putney to Brattleboro. People would commute to work. I don't have a uh, question, but I'd like to add something. There's a wonderful book out. It's a bit old. It's called Asphalt Nation. It was, it was written in the uh, 80s, and it, it's all about the impact of the automobile, actually primarily what it costs. And, Although it's an old book, the only thing that's really changed in it is the size of the numbers. And what it essentially tells us is that the price you pay to run an automobile is in fact only about one-fifth of what it actually costs. So if you're spending an average car today is about 40 cents a mile to operate when you're realistic about all of the attendant expenses. In fact, it's more like uh, $2 or, or even more near to $3 a mile when you start adding in the cost of all the infrastructure, the fact that 70% of all state police work is involved with motor vehicles, all the courts, all the court time, the court system, the uh, energy problems and the, and the environmental problems that have to be cleaned up and dealt with, salting and uh, 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 clean sandblasting buildings after years of uh, automobile uh, uh, smut and smoke, et cetera, et cetera. So the cost of running a car is actually astonishing. The balance of interest in the transportation committee between uh, motor transport, uh, I guess bicycle, and then uh, and also train, and particularly. <laughs> Uh, with the uh, railroad upgrades uh, south of here, and as I understand it, the state of Massachusetts will be running commuter rail to Greenfield. Uh, what uh, interest there is, how much it is on the Vermont transportation uh, uh, radar screen at this point to extend uh, commuter rail to Brattleboro? To what, what interest is there in balance of interest on the transportation committee? Well. Uh, we haven't talked about that issue specifically, about extending commuter rail to Brattleboro, but I would say that in our committee, there is very, very strong support for rail. Very strong support. And that's been great. Everybody recognizes, we have um, a few members from the Rutland area, and of course Rutland was in danger of losing their passenger rail service um, in the last couple of years of the Douglas administration when they were doing budget cuts. And the Rutland business community recognize the value of having that train that comes from New York City all the way to Rutland. Because they don't have an interstate, they don't have, they, they feel that they're sort of shortchanged in terms of transportation. And they lobby the governor to get them to keep it. And so I think that it's a very non-political issue. Rail is recognized, people recognize it's really good for business, it's really good for the environment. So there's widespread support for rail. In terms of alternatives, in terms of bike pad, and it's changing. Uh, we have a few members who are more, when I first went to the transportation committee, people said, oh, well, it's just sort of like a, you know, people are just concerned about paving and roads and bridges. And, and it's been gradually changing with the addition of, you know, several members, and we sort of have a, have a, um, a cluster of people in our committee. We have 11 members in our committee who are really, committed to sort of widening the discussion about what transportation means. And so uh, that's been good. And, and uh, I think that the, the climate is changing in terms, of, in terms of that, in terms of people sort of thinking more broadly about transportation. So I would say that we're in a good situation. Not perfect, you know, they're sort of trying to, always trying to balance interests. But the trains, which sort of drives the budget, they come in with their budget. They, I, the, the first time we had VTrans come in in the 
first days of the Shumlin administration, came in and said, okay, our priorities are, you know, a robust transportation system, including bicycles, pedestrian, rail. And, you know, I almost fell off my chair because it had been such a push before that. I, I was only in two years under the Douglas administration. But there is a, a widespread, which is not to, you know, sort of uh, denigrate that. It's just a different way of thinking. You know, there was a different way of thinking about, and I think coming with a, a sort of awareness about how much it costs and, and all of that, I think there's a, a difference in, in how people are thinking in general. Um, okay. So what can, what can we, uh, what can members of the public do about making a more robust public transit system? Well, I am on the Public Transit Advisory Committee for the state. We have meetings three or four times a year, and we meet with a bunch of stakeholders, people from uh, on Center for Independent Living, uh, et cetera, people from uh, the, the tra 10 transit companies. We have actually, it's not perfect, but we do have, uh, are lucky in Vermont, I think, to have about 10 regional public transit uh, providers and providing rides for, um, for people to get to doctor's appointments who need them. And I think Candace probably knows a lot about that. Rides <coughs> for um, well, there's there's Medicaid transportation, there's elderly and disabled transportation. So the question, as I said, is the funding and federal funding. You can oh, the state has actually been very proactive in trying to flex some federal highway funding into public transit, but you can only do so much. So the limitation is funding, but. Uh, I think that I, you know, you can, there are maybe ways to work with the local transit providers to see what they could do, like uh, Connecticut River Transit, to see what they can do. If there's specific gaps that you notice, to bring that to their attention on the local level. Uh, I'm not sure who's, for a while, Deerfield Valley, you know, the, the mover uh, people were running the Connecticut River Transit because they had a change of management, so I'm not sure who's there now. But I think first, as a start, to contact the local provider, you know, and say, what can we do about this? And then they can bring that to, you know, state funding. You can let me know what your concerns are. But it, it's, there's, it's not for lack of, of, uh, of will on the state's part. And they also are trying to do a better job. Oh, one of the things, actually, I forgot to mention, is that we were, uh, a few years ago, in danger of losing our Greyhound service altogether. There's one bus that goes from Wyatt River Junction down to Springfield, Mass. And because there was no venue that the uh, Greyhound could find, you know, they don't provide their own ticket office anymore. They have to, you know, have it somewhere. And the place where they have it <coughs> on Putney Road was, so they didn't want to do it anymore. They, I can't remember why. So the uh, Wyndham Regional Planning Commission, and that's another resource. I don't know if any of you know Matt Mann, who's the transportation planner with Wyndham Regional. And he's really excellent and you can contact him about any concerns you have about any transportation issues, because he's sort of the conduit between the town and the concerns of the town and the state, and he's in communication with them, he's in communication with them about the 91 bridge, about all the different transportation issues, about prioritizing uh, projects that get sent to the state. So um, I think that uh, there are ways to uh, address that issue. Oh, but what I was gonna say, so Matt, and, and the V-Trans went to work and they found the gas station now on Canal Street acts as the agent, the ticket agent for, for Greyhound. And what the state did is the state then was really, we, during our conversations on public transit, and they, there was a study done by a consulting firm that, you know, Vermont has lost so much in terms of Greyhound, in what they call inner city bus service. Bus service that connects to other, other places to, you know, where you can get to Boston or, and they, the state put out a request for proposal <coughs> and got, and is funding two other routes. One that's gonna go from Rutland to White River. I think it's already started. And I think they even connect up with the um, Dartmouth coach. And the other one that's going from Burlington to Albany because up until now, people in Burlington had really no public transit way to get to Albany. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, my brother was visiting and I said, oh, I'll just drive you over to Bennington. You can get the bus and I found out 
bus routes not known anymore. And there used to be a little van that came from Bennington over the mountain to Brattleboro. So we've lost so much, in addition to losing rail, we've lost so much public transit. But so I want to say, again, you know, kudos to the state for really recognizing this as a problem. And then they're trying to coordinate regional public transit with inner city bus and rail so that, you know, you can, uh, and, oh, and I forgot to mention park and rides too, another part of the, of the equation about how to, um, how to make transportation more flexible. And the state is really investing in park and rides. And that gets into what I didn't talk about was the, the um, comprehensive state energy plan, which is has a transportation part of it. And there's a whole, you could find that online, what the, what the plan is for the state in terms of cutting transportation emissions and creating more livable communities. I used to take the Vermont Transit and the airport to Boston. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. Can't, can't we? Your last point, I think that um, that's exactly what AARP has been trying to work on in terms of, you know, the complete streets legislation. They recognize this as a big issue that a lot of people who are aging and want to age in place need to get around. So how how do we make that happen? We talk, uh, actually, in our meeting today, we were talking about even having little van services or, or taxi services that would supplement public transit. So it's on the radar, but I will bring that concern. But the other thing I forgot to say is that actually there is a bus from Greenfield, I mean from Boston to Brattleboro on weekends. I don't know if anybody knows that. You can go on a Friday. There are two buses a day on Sunday, I think. I forget now the way it is. I don't have the schedule in my head. But only Fridays and Sundays. If you go in to the internet and you're trying to buy a ticket to Boston, it'll say that it's going to take you, you know, almost 24 hours. You have to go to Springfield. You have to stay overnight. You have to, but on, on Fridays and Sundays, you can go to the Canal Street Station, you can get on a bus, I, I wish I could remember, and I can get that information to you. Uh, get to Boston in about three hours, and the same coming back. So it works both ways. You can go from Brattleboro to Boston on a Friday, you can go from Boston to Brattleboro on a Friday. You can go from Brattleboro to Boston on a Sunday, and you can go from Boston to Brattleboro on a Sunday. So that's a big improvement, and that's only been in the past I don't know, six, three or four months, I forget. And then I got an email from somebody who was trying to get to Boston, and I and I went on, and I went, yeah, they're right, it's taking, you know, I knew that the bus from Boston had been gone for many years. And then I, and then I, for some reason I remembered, oh yeah, and then I, I did the research online and found out that, in fact, that was pretty good. I think that, um, I, 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 somebody mentioned the rail project uh, south, so the state, during uh, uh, as part of the federal stimulus money, got money to fix up the track in Vermont, the Vermonter line from Brattleboro up to St. Albans. And they have cut the running time of that train because of imp improvements. We got like $52.7 million in improvements. And that has cut the, the time that it takes to get through Vermont. Then at the same time, Massachusetts and Connecticut received grants so that now, if you get on a train going south, up until now, you had to go way east to Palmer, Mass, and have to like, take an extra 45 minutes to make that transfer because the tracks did not go directly down the Connecticut River. Now the train is going to go through Greenfield, straight down through Springfield to New Haven. <coughs> so that's another improvement. We'll cut off about 45 minutes. So in terms of traveling due south down towards New York, there is only one train a day, but it exists and they're fixing up the track. So, so things are not great, but they're moving in a good direction. And there is a lot of discussion about how can we get another train a day? There's a lot of discussion. I mean, I think, I think some kind of, I've always thought that it would be really neat for some person who wanted, enterprising person who wanted to start a business to uh, start a little uh, taxi business for seniors. 
around town and make it affordable. You know, where you wouldn't have to be just, I mean, we do sort of have that if you're going to specific medical appointments, but, but to, um, so you weren't the only person in the taxi. You know, sort of a shared taxi, a jitney, exactly. And even to the outlying towns. Uh, you know, in some cities in, in South America, you go to a central place and this cat is going to this town and this one's going to this town and Cardinals. everybody loads in with their groceries and and I've always thought, could somebody start that in Brattleboro? Wouldn't that be great? The question is, what what's going on with the bridge that comes over from Kingsdale? And I asked that question for a couple reasons. One is, is that, I, my understanding is that the state of New Hampshire has made a commitment that they'll make a bike friendly, um, uh, it, it accessible for bike friendly, and I know that there that, that would connect with a bike trail here in Brattleboro, giving us a tremendous amount of riding uh, into and through New Hampshire. Going from Brattleboro to New Hampshire on a bicycle, like would think you might know, is either if you take your life in your hands going over the bridges, or you walk most of it because it's you're, you're on a sidewalk, and let's face it, other people are using that. It's not a it, it, it's not for, for for cyclists. It's to get off and bike walk your bike across. The other piece I, I reason I bring that up is because. On my trip to uh, Connecticut the other day, um, my fiance and I Googled the directions. And just for the, for, 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 uh, for the fun of it, I hit the button to see how long would it take me to cycle there. Mm. Now, that's not really what, what, what was impressive. What was impressive is that the directions told me to go through Malfunction Junction. Google oh, I heard that. on yeah. the internet actually Maybe. considers that Malfunction yeah. Junction yeah. and not in standard lettering, it is in bold letters. <laughs> so I would wonder. I guess my, my question is: Is what's going on with that, or, or is that in the talks? Is it, it, it you know, where are we with the bridge? Uh, regarding the bridge, the bridge is very interesting. As as you probably all know, the bridge is owned by New Hampshire, and it's it's also the big issue with the uh, the, the Vilas Bridge up in Bellas Falls, and New Hampshire just sort of summarily dropped it from their project list a few years ago. They just and I have to say that um, that really doesn't happen in Vermont. Once something's on the project list, it might get delayed, but this is just sort of taken off, a race. And uh, I've been in a couple meetings with uh, New Hampshire representatives, and I think it's back on the list, but it's not gonna happen anytime soon. And they, what people have told me is that, you know, New Hampshire, they're concerned with Southeast New Hampshire. And Southwestern New Hampshire, you know, is a little off the, off the map. I think that the plan is to do the bridge. I'm sure the bridge will have uh, provision for bicycle pedestrians, but I think the plan is also to use the old bridge as a pedestrian and bike bridge. Oh. So they're not gonna tear that bridge down. Mm -hmm. The bridge cycle is going to go bridge. downstream. The plan for the bridge is downstream, where the Blue Seal P uh, uh, building is right now. But I don't see that happening anytime soon, unless, and this could happen, you know, that bridge is, uh, the Green River Cover Bridge you may have noticed is um, just the low grade was just dropped from eight tons to four. And now, in the, if that happens in the winter, the snow plows are not gonna be able to get across. So um, if that rating were dropped, and it's like a, I forget, you know, 20 mile round trip from coming around Chesterfield. So there are issues, and there are issues like this all over the state, with bridges getting, all of a sudden, immediately, you remember a couple years ago, the Champlain Bridge across to New York State, immediately, they had to close it immediately. People had to make a hundred mile uh, commute round trip in order to get to work. There were farms who had fields on both sides of the lake. Uh, people were rowing in boats across. I mean, it was a really desperate situation and the state moved really fast to get that bridge up. So sometimes, you know, if that bridge were closed, it would definitely move up the priority. The was that VTrans um, toll free number. There's two resources to help you get from point A to point B. So 1-800-865-RIDE. Is a, is a call center, those folks, you don't have to manage the internet and figure out the schedules because who can read those? So they will help you get from point A to point B. So they'll have the code wow. for the Amtrak. They'll know the schedule for the, the trains to and from Boston. Okay. And then 211 is 24-7. So, and they have access to the same database that the VTrans call center does. So VTrans call center, I think, is Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, 211, free, toll free, 30, 365, seven days a week. Um, so you can talk to a real person who can help you get from where you are to where you need to go and back here. And um, say, and say that 1-800-what? 1-800-865-RIDE, R-I-T-E. Just two brief announcements. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Governor Peter Shumlin will be in town on July 9th, but he's being hosted by the Chamber of Commerce 
and I talked to Kate O'Connor yesterday, and uh, so if you want to attend the luncheon, it's a $15 luncheon, check in with Kate O'Connor at the chamber, because they're gonna give opportunity for chamber folks first, uh, and there's limited seating uh, at the venue. Uh, on, uh, if you're also interested, that, that will be a discussion on economic development in Wyndham County. And to continue that discussion, the next evening on the 10th at the Rattleboro Select Board at 5.30, uh, there's an open meeting, uh, public hearing, with the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Economic Development Authority. Uh, so that will be specifically on loan programs associated with the Vermont, um, or the Wyndham County Economic Development Fund. Would you review the dates and times? Uh, yes, the, the governor will be here on July 9th, which is a Wednesday, and that's a, an event hosted by the chamber, so see Kate O'Connor, and the public hearing is at the Brattleboro Select Board on the 10th, the next day, Thursday, uh, and that is at 5.30 to 7 o'clock in the Brattleboro Select Board meeting room.